Well, good evening. It's good to see all of you. Certainly happy for the presence of all. We're studying in the book of uh, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 12, and last time we left off at verse 22. So before we uh, enter into our study this evening, help us prepare our minds to study God's Word, we'll ask Brother Derek to direct our minds. Amen. All right, we've been looking at uh, different uh, examples that Matthew has given to us of controversy that Jesus had with the scribes and Pharisees over the Sabbath day and healings on the Sabbath day and uh, different uh, uh, service that the disciples had been doing on the Sabbath day. And really this conflict continues as you get to verse 22. It shows how far the scribes and Pharisees were willing to go in trying to undermine uh, Jesus and um, blunt his influence with people. And of course, it uh, shows an example of just how um, far people will go in our day and age as well in order to try to resist the gospel truth and to uphold their party in religion. And we have to be on guard for these same things. The Pharisees are rebuked because of a blasphemous accusation that they bring against Jesus as far as this healing that he's doing. They can't deny the healings that are going on or the miracles that are being performed, but instead they decide they're going to misrepresent and try to uh, deceive people as far as what the source of the power of Jesus' miracles are. It says in verse 22, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him. So that the mute man spoke and saw, and all the crowd were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? So here is another tremendous uh, miracle that takes place. There's a triple miracle that happens. Uh, A a miracle is an act of uh, divine power that, you know, none of us apart from God would be able to do, and Casting out a demon, I don't have the power to do that. But Jesus, with the power of God, is able to um, overcome these evil spirits and cause them to let people go free. And when this demon's possessed people, one of the things that you see over and over again is that this uh, taking over a person's body and uh, binding their um, soul... would have physical uh, manifestations in the person's health. Sometimes it paralyzed people, give them epilepsy, or other times they wouldn't be able to see or hear, uh, wouldn't be able to speak because of this invasion from this unclean spirit that's entered into them. Sometimes they they just uh, um, are driven about to live among the tombs like one man we read about, you know, and gashes himself with stones in his misery that he has. Uh, they manifest sometimes that superhuman strength because of these demons. But in this case, the man is blind. He is unable to see. Uh, the, the word there means a smoke of darkness is the literal meaning. comes over your eyes. That was their word for blindness. And then also, his, uh, he suffers bluntness is the literal word there. It can either mean that you're uh, unable to speak or you're unable to hear according to the context. But since it says he cast the demon out and he could see and speak, then we know what the bluntness was. He was not able to speak. He was mute or dumb as uh, you know, the older word that people used for the inability to speak. And yet here are these things that we, we can't cure blindness or, or uh, this inability of somebody to speak <laughs> instantaneously. This man's instantaneously set free from the devil by his influence through a demon. And also all of these physical manifestations are uh, removed and the man can begin to talk and he can see normally. So there's, there's obviously some, something was in him. You know, that's evidence. There was something wrong with him. Something had taken possession of him and now it's gone. So you have a, a, 
you know, it's one thing to say you, you have a demon and you're perfectly good health. There's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> and I say, I'm casting that demon out of somebody. Well, how do you know that there was ever a demon in there or not? But in this guy's case, there's obviously something that was wrong with him, and now it's gone. And so that you have an outward, it makes it a sign, doesn't it? You can see the power was, was operating there. And the people see it, and they are amazed. And the word for amazed there is the same word uh, when you talk about somebody just being shocked out of their mind. Like, uh, and it's not always used just about in a positive way of excitement, but when uh, uh, Festus says to Paul, you, your great learning has driven you mad. The word mad there is the same word amazed here. You're beside yourself. <laughs> So you're so shocked when you see something, you're so excited by it that you can't think straight. Have you ever, um, you know, I, I get that way watching football sometimes. Uh, when, we, when we come back and you think, oh, the game's lost, and then there's sooner magic, <laughs> we win the game. I'm kind of out, outside myself a little bit. Well, that's the way these people were. They see Jesus do this sign, and it just shocks them out of their mind. You know, they're just, this can't be the son of David, can it? Now, who, of course he's the son of David. His, his mother is from the tribe of family of David, and so was Joseph. So, I mean, that, but you know they mean more than that, right? When they say this can't be the son of David, can it? They, that's the Messiah is what they're talking about. The Christ that was promised to come through David. Can this be the Christ? And uh, that's really what they should have begun to recognize about him. And uh, sort of a cautious question, notice the way that at least in the New American Standard, they indicate that it's like, they say it cautiously. It says, this cannot be the son of David, can he? It's like, no, but sure, sure seems like it. <laughs> you know, and then, wow. Uh, but they say it in that kind of negative way. I guess you don't get in trouble if you say, can he? Ask it as a question instead of just confessing it outright. And... You can imagine these scribes and Pharisees, that's the last thing they want to hear the people say, right? He's the Christ. So they're going to have to step in here and try to undo some of this influence. Yes. Well, um, I think even in the King James, they're trying to indicate it wasn't a positive, uh, you know, just an outright positive. He's the son of David. They're kind of asking this as a question. And like say in the Greek, It'll say, it actually indicates negative or positive when you ask a question. And so they're saying it in kind of a, this can't be him, can it? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the idea of the expression. Uh, we're not saying it is, but wow, look what he's doing, you know? Right. And in the, the, pe the reference there, Luke 20 and verse 41 they, they, ask, they put son of David and Christ together in the same statement when, when they say that, when he has his uh, um, triumphal entry. And uh, so, you know, is this the hope of Israel? <laughs> no. You know, could, could it be? No. Uh, but the scribes and Pharisees, they don't want to hear anybody bringing that up at all. So they just saw this great miracle take place. How are you going to discredit it? It's obviously... Uh, supernatural power that's being used. So uh, the next verse we see their diabolical uh, plan here to try to undermine Jesus. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So you talk about cunning and uh, blasphemy put together. That they come up with a way to try to discredit a real... You know, how does God show you that he approves of a prophet or a teacher? It's through miracles. <laughs> and yet they say, well, we don't know about where this power came from. He is doing this by... The power of the devil. That's where he's getting the power to cast out these demons and tell them what to do. Is that he's working uh, with by Beelzebul. Beelzebul was a, you know, a, a god among the Philistines, 
and it literally means the god of flies. They, always, they named their gods after a lot of times the attributes they would apply to them um, is being able to get rid of pests and things. That was part of their, uh, Zeus was supposed to get rid of flies. Apollo got rid of vermin, the <coughs> god of vermin. <laughs> he could, he could, but the Jews, of course, took it the other way. They took it about, yeah, he is. He, these are false gods that are unclean. And that, that's a proper name for the devil, is Beelzebul. And you can say he, he, he goes right straight to what they're talking about. They were using Beelzebul as a name for the devil. As he says, Satan doesn't cast out Satan. You're doing this by Beelzebul. Jesus says, Satan doesn't do this. So it was a, a term the Jews used to talk about Satan or the devil, is Beelzebul. Um, uh, unclean, most unclean spirit of all, right? The head of the unclean spirits is the devil. And very clever argument, which invisible power, it'd be difficult to prove that. See, you'd say, well, there's some, it, it could be God or the devil, is this their argument. And since he doesn't teach what we teach, it's got to be the devil, right? That'd be their point of view. And Jesus sees this as a very dangerous, undermining thing to take true miracles of God and apply them to the devil. I mean, you can't get much lower than that. And uh, this is the thing that is his credentials, along with every prophet or Moses or anybody that came before. And now all of a sudden they're changing the rules, right? And saying, oh no, it's the devil causing these things to happen. So he, he answers it with three different answers. He gives three different arguments to show. He's not going to let this pass. He knows it's a dangerous thing to people's minds. So the first thing is that it's absurd that the devil is attacking himself. And, I mean, don't you think that is a true argument? Uh, you know, I, I've got a powerful kingdom and army and special forces and everything, and I'm taking all the outposts and, and uh, we're putting it out in the news and everything, and, and the other side says... No, we're, we're attacking our own forts. That's not, that's not the Americans doing that. We're, we're doing that. Why? Why would you be attacking yourself? All right. uh, same, same argument here. Would he be robbing himself? Here this demon has come down and taken a prize. Uh, uh, it's taken a person's uh, body and soul over. Possessed them. And yet he's going to cast them out. That works against what his, he's all about. <laughs> He's all about trying to take people over and influencing them against God some way or another. So Satan has a kingdom. Isn't that what it says here? There are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God. There's the kingdom of the devil. And Satan has a kingdom. But his kingdom is not going to fight against itself. And the kingdom of Christ, of course, shouldn't do that either, right? I mean, it would, would, you have internal division in a, in a country in a civil war. That's the surest way to bring a country down is to get the people fighting with each other. And it's happened many times in history. The reason the Romans took over Judea was because there were two factions of the Jews fighting with each other. And both of them wanted the Romans to come in and help them. And so they came in and they just stayed. <laughs> they just took over. And it's happened many times in history. So when you start fighting yourself, your kingdom's going to fall. You think, well, how could America ever fall? Well, what if we started shooting our rockets and missiles and bombs at each other? Wouldn't it be easy for somebody to come in then, take us over? Um, so Satan's not going to fight against himself. That's, that's the first point to make. And then verses seven, 27 and 28. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be your judges. So he, he makes a second argument. He says, well, what are you going to say about your disciples that are out claiming that they cast out demons? Are they using Satan's power to do that? Is that what you're saying? Or are they going to come back and say, no, you can't cast out demons with Satan's power. We're using the word of God or whatever incantations they were using to say they were casting out demons. So he says, your, your own disciples will condemn you for saying that about them. Doesn't that just show a clear prejudice? If their disciples are casting them out, it's the power of God. But if Jesus does it, it's the power of the devil. They're both supposed to be doing the same thing. So why, why, what's the difference? So he's just showing how illogical 
and un, unfair, uh, inconsistent, this particular argument is that you're making. So he, he, it's absurd, it's inconsistent, and then he tells again, shows their evil motive, and then he gives a third answer, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So here's the reality. <laughs> and remember the people asked, this couldn't be the son of David, could it? The Christ, the king? Could the king be here? And he said, if I am casting out by the power of God, then the king has come, right? I mean, that's the implication that this kingdom that you're all waiting on, it's already beginning to start having an influence, right? There's some evidence, if you're reading the signs of the time, that there's about to be a new kingdom come to power, right? That's the idea. That's what these miracles are showing. Didn't it show there was something new about to happen when all of those plagues came on Egypt and Moses was doing all those things and Pharaoh couldn't do anything to stop it? And... You say, there's a new power arising for the Jews. Another man people are going to be baptized into. They're not going to be following Pharaoh anymore. They're going to be following this Moses, right? And same thing here. You see these miracles coming by Jesus and his disciples? The kingdom of God has come upon you. This rule of God is about to arise. Now, it didn't fully come till the day of Pentecost, but the king is here. <laughs> He's doing work. He's getting laying the foundation for everything, and it's about to happen. So that seems to be the meaning of the expression, and the kingdom has come upon you. It's like overshadowing things already. Uh, these events are about to happen. So casting out these demons, that, that's a sign. There's a greater spiritual power that's here uh, than the devil. Somebody that can conquer the devil is on the scene. And uh, cure these diseases, set people free, forgive their sins. So there's an invading king that's come on the scene. Then verse 29 and 30. You might say in another place, in one of the other gospels, instead uh, he says, the finger, if I do this by the finger of God. You see the way uh, parts of your body, your hand, your finger are used for your power. You know, your influence is your finger, right? <laughs> Some of us, maybe we just, we type with all our fingers. Some people type with just one finger. <laughs> a finger, you know, is able to do these things. Push a button on the car or whatever. Well, God's got his finger is his, his divine power that's working in Jesus. So, um, the finger of God, that's what those... Um, magicians at the time when Moses uh, caused the, you know, they just threw the, the soot up in the air and it turned into those uh, uh, biting insects that came out and started biting people and stuff. And they said, this is the finger of God. They use that same expression. We can't fake this miracle that he's doing now. This is the finger of God. And God wrote the Ten Commandments, it says, with his finger, right? So, it's the power of God. And you can see it. One gospel says power of God. The other says finger. So maybe he said both, but we know they mean the same thing. Um, then says, or how can any, anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me and he who does not gather with me scatters. So he tells them, I've come with this power, and what do the, these miracles show in casting out demons? Satan has taken over this person's body. That's their house. <laughs> you know, if anything's your house, it's your body, isn't it? It's your tabernacle where your spirit is. And Satan, the strong man, has taken over. He had a home invasion, <laughs> and he is in charge now. How can you set this person free? You've got to bind the strong man and take the goods away from him. And that's what Jesus did. Someone stronger than the devil is here. That's the point. How, did you, how can we prove? Uh, you say, well, you know, Satan's awful powerful. Look at all the people that follow him and everything. How do we know Jesus is more powerful? He bound the strong man and he took away his possessions. That's maybe one of the reasons for that period of time 
God allowed these demons to possess people. You need a physical demonstration where people can see it. You know, <laughs> we don't have to speculate about it. Here are demons. Here's Jesus. Who's stronger? Well, Jesus is stronger. Just with a word, he casts them out. They tremble, fall at his feet, beg him not to hurt them or whatever. They're afraid of him. That's what is shown in all of these possessions and people being healed. So he says there's somebody stronger than the strong man. He's come in and bound him and taken over his house and stole his goods, which is these men and women that are possessed and has set their souls free from him. And of course, if he can do that, then we ought to listen to what he says about how to free your soul from sin, right? He, he's got the authority and the power behind him that we ought to believe him when he tells us what to do. Um, so miraculous divine credentials is what um, Jesus has, and that's what these miracles are, and that's what these Pharisees and scribes should see. Um, so the question comes down, whose side are you on? Right? Are you on... Are you arguing for the devil's side? Jesus has come to fight the devil and set people free. And here these scribes and Pharisees, they're in opposition to him. He says, you've got to choose sides. You're either for me or you're against me. You're either for Christ or you're for the devil. There's only two kingdoms. You're either in one or you're in the other. Which one are you in? <laughs> A lot of people want to try to be in both. But Jesus says you can't be in both. You, you have to make up your mind what side you're on. When people, um, you know, I've known people in my own family that, that really nice people and fun people to be around, but they, they, they won't submit to God or obey the gospel. And what, are the, what does their influence become towards people that like them and know them or their children or their grandchildren when they don't obey the gospel? They are a hindrance to the truth. And other people obeying, they say, well, he didn't obey and we really like him a lot and he doesn't think the gospel is very important. So you are a hindrance to the truth if you don't get on board, right? So you're either helping or you're hurting, one or the other. And we need to be wholeheartedly on the Lord's side and uh, recognize that neutrality isn't an option according to Jesus. You can't, you can't be both. You've got you to get on or off. Then he tells them just how serious this kind of accusation is that they're making. That they are in danger of committing an eternal sin by saying the Holy Spirit is the devil. I mean, you can't, if you get to that state that you start applying the... If you, if you start saying what the Holy Spirit is and does is the devil, how are you going to be saved? There's no being saved, is there? Because the Holy Spirit's the one, the last witness to show us that Jesus is the Christ and we need to get out of sin. And if, if we say that's the devil, we're never going to get out of sin, are we? It's, we've committed an eternal sin if we reject the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's really what he gets at here. He says, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this age or in the age to come. So it says, you, you better take heed what you're doing when you start coming out and saying the Holy Spirit is the devil. Because that's what, really what they said, wasn't it? There's no hope for a person being converted if they do that. And there's some people have that attitude. I, you know, there are some people that think of our God and the Holy Spirit and the Bible as the devil. That's, they look at it that way. It's the biggest evil there is, is the Bible. Do you think they're ever going to be saved? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, what, what's going to shake that if that's your attitude? You, you can't appeal. There's no scripture you can use to talk to them because they think anything the Bible says is bad. So... He says, this, you, you speak against the Holy Spirit and call him a demon. You, you, uh, your heart is in a bad spot. Right? That is a malicious, willful, and uh, it very likely could put a person just beyond all reform if you go there. And it seems like a lot of these guys had their hearts set like that, didn't they? I mean, they saw Jesus and what he did, and then 
Peter and John stood before that same council and they said, a noteworthy miracle has happened. We can't deny it, but we got to stop these guys. Right? They didn't, it didn't affect them at all. They, they beat the apostles, told them not to preach anymore. It didn't have any effect. That shows just how far you can go in your opposition to the Holy Spirit to where there's no appealing to you anymore. But I don't know what else can you do. Uh, you, you, you heal a lame man that's been lame for 38 years or whatever. What else could you show somebody that that's not going to work to get through to them? They say, no, that's the devil did that. So the Holy Spirit, the, you know, you think of what's the sin against the uh, uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? A lot of, a lot of uh, scholars and brethren will say simply applying just what happened here, that you take the Holy Spirit's work and you say it's the devil. I mean, that's, that's, you say the Holy Spirit's a demon. If, you, if you're willing to go there, then what's the hope? There's some take it in a more broad way, and certainly we know about other sins that are committed unto death, right, that we read about in 1 John, uh, that a person in the book of Hebrews, after you've tasted the heavenly gift and done all of that thing and you willfully go on sinning, that you can get to the point you're so hard and callous in your heart that there's no repentance. There's no, no coming to repentance. And that, that's another form, I guess, of the same kind of a sin that you've so hardened yourself against the gospel and turned your back on it that now nobody can reach you. There's no, nobody can come talk to you and get you to, to, to repent because you've denied the Holy Spirit and His Word. If you don't recognize it as His Word anymore, who can appeal to you? It's been said, you know, you think... He says, now, if you, if you blaspheme God, you can be forgiven of that. God, um, you've still got other ways that can bring about repentance. If you, if you deny God the Father, well, he sent some prophets, and he sent Jesus, and he sent John the Baptist, and then he sent the apostles. There's some people that might wake you up to repent about blaspheming God, right? <laughs> or Jesus, you blaspheme Jesus. Well, there's still hope that the Holy Spirit might be able to convert you to where you'd repent of, of, of blaspheming Jesus. Didn't Paul say he blasphemed? He said, I was a blasphemer. He blasphemed Jesus. He tried to get people to deny Jesus, even tortured them. But he was still able, after that, to be converted and become an apostle. But if you get so far that you totally reject the Holy Spirit, he's the last witness. He's the last one that's going to give the evidence and if you reject him, then he says there is no forgiveness for that. There's no, there's no overcoming that. So if you reject the final appeal of the, of the gospel, uh, confirmed by the Spirit, then there's not any hope. Right? Well, we know the Jews after this, um, Justin Martyr and, and Origen, or a couple of early Christian debaters and, and, uh, that you know, had debates with the Jews and so on, and they both mentioned that one of their arguments was he uses magic. That's why his miracles are, are magic. So it's similar. Yeah, in the scriptures, right. But, uh, you know, it's still, <laughs> after that, maybe that's a little bit different form of the same argument. But you're saying some dark power trick or whatever uh, he's using to bind these spirits. It's not God's power. So they were still using that later, that, that idea to try to undo the miracles. They can't deny the miracles because everybody sees them, right? So they got to come up with some other way to get around. He's using magic. He's using other dark spirits out here to do it or whatever. He's, that's their... Yeah, I I'm, I, I'm trying to think in the Gospels. I can't think of a right off my top of my head, yeah. So it is saying he's got an unclean spirit. That's one way, certainly, from Mark. And then the other way would be, like I say, you... The Holy Spirit's teaching you deny it. If you deny the gospel, it's, it's the word of God, what's going to convert you? Right? There's not anything left to convert you. It's the power of God for salvation. You don't going to use that. What do you got? Um, either make the tree good and its fruits good, or make the tree bad and its fruits bad. For the tree is known by its fruits. So here's Jesus. What is Jesus doing? He's... 
healing people. He's teaching the truth. <laughs> He's raising the dead, casting out demons. Isn't that good? Fruit. Now, if the fruit is good, why are you saying the tree is bad? Right? Isn't that what they're doing? They're, you say, Jesus is doing all this good stuff, but he's evil. He's not following our rules. Right? He's not a part of our party. So make up your mind, you can't have good fruit in a bad tree. If you're getting all this good fruit from a tree, the tree must be good, right? What makes a tree bad? The fruit's what will make it bad, right? So you, you see his point? <laughs> if, you, if you're going to say, he said, if you don't believe in, in the Gospel of John, he'll say, don't believe me because of me. Believe because of the works, right? And if you believe the works, why don't you believe me? Right? The fruit's good. Why don't you make the tree good? And uh, it shows, I mean, there's a truth there about all of us, isn't it? That if, uh, if we got foul language and we lie and we teach false doctrine, you think the tree is good? <laughs> no. The tree's bad. The character is bad. If all the fruit's bad, how do you judge what somebody's character is? So it works the other way. I mean, we can argue the other way around. If you're going to be a good character, you're going to have to have good fruit, right? You can't go around saying, I'm a good Christian, and you don't do the things that Christ says to do, right? That's not a good Christian. You know the tree by its fruit. So Jesus is doing all of this good. He never commits a sin. He has these acts of power that only God could do. So why don't you... you know, this is a good... This is... The Son of God. This is the person we should be following. So he uh, sets forth that basic argument. You know, there's a lot of the Proverbs when you're studying the book of Proverbs and it'll say something about... It almost sounds like, well, that's just a truism. You know, like both sides of the proverb kind of say the same thing. But most of the time, if you notice, one of them will be talking about what you do and the other is talking about what you is. Right? <laughs> so it's showing the same thing in those Proverbs. You know, a liar will... You know, he'll lie, but he's false on the inside. That's, that's the thing that it'll point out to you. If you see this on the outside, that's what the person is on the inside. And see that over and over again in the book of Proverbs. And here Jesus is bringing out that same wisdom. Why don't you make the tree good if the fruit's good? Uh, let's see. Verse 34 says, You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Wow, that's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? They said, you're working things by the devil. Did he take that line down? He did not. He comes right back and says, but you're sons of snakes. You're, you're deceptive serpents. Just the same rule, isn't it? Same thing. A good tree makes good fruit. And if you, you're spouting this kind of evil out of your mouth, what does that say is on the inside? Right? Who, what kind of nature, who are you imitating? Are you imitating God? Or are you imitating that snake that deceived Eve back there in the beginning? You're full of poison. So how can you be an evil say what's good? You can't. You're gonna, I, I'm not surprised you're saying stuff like you are because your heart's not right. That's really what he's saying, isn't it? Your heart is wrong, and we can see by the way you talk that your heart's not right. Which, of course, what does that say about our language and the way things we say and the way we respond to people? If we are saying, losing our temper, using words that are foul and, and unworthy, what does it say about what's on the inside? There's not, something not right in our life, and our heart, if we're doing that. So he says, how, how could you? So that's, uh, um, well, I ran out of time. We'll come back and take up that context, and maybe next week we'll actually have overhead or something. We never know. <laughs>